Stefan, welcome. <laughs> Perfect. You made it. I was worried about uh, daylight savings time, but. Yeah, yeah, but I checked it double, you know. <laughs> Got it. Okay, everybody is very anxious to hear you today. Very excited. Well, um, we, we won't exaggerate, right? <laughs> we, right. So I'm going, I'm going to just do a very brief introduction. Um, and because I think most everybody actually knows who you are. And like I said, they're very excited to hear you. Okay. Um, Look, uh, Tom, you have uh, a reflection on your I know. Classes. Okay. <laughs> I know there's nothing I can do about that. Okay. Um, let me just turn up the sound a little bit. So uh, I am actually honored to have Stefan join us today. Uh, I am also very happy to, uh, I think I can call Stefan a new friend of mine. And we've had a lot of collaboration in the past few months and uh, much to my benefit, I would say. <laughs> uh, and to mine, you know. And, and one, one thing I would say, which I was thinking about this, I, I can't really think of anybody who I think knows more about uh, the history and the practice of virology than Stefan Lenka. But it's a curious thing to say that because it reminds me of uh, a few days ago, I was invited by a group of doctors to join a working group on viruses. And of course I said, uh, asked what time it was and they set a time and I said, oh, I can't do it at that time because that's when my meeting about unicorns is. Um, and and <laughs> to, say, to say you're an expert on viruses, <laughs> It's a bit like uh, being an expert on unicorns, uh, although unicorns have prettier pictures. Um, so it's a funny thing to say. But anyways, um, so with that, I just want to say what were uh, the things I we're hoping to hear or hoping you would address. First of all, is, is just the history of virology, which you, I've heard you speak on this before, and it really puts everything in context. Uh, the next thing which I hear a lot from people is has a pathogenic virus actually ever been seen from a sick human being? Uh, and it's a very interesting question. And I think, think I know the answer to that, but I will uh, let you uh, say it. And then we would love to hear about the experiments that you're doing now uh, and what it is that you're hoping to demonstrate and why it's so important to demonstrate these, these things. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn the uh, floor over to Stefan, and he's going to tell us a little about the history of virology and how we got into this mess that we're in now. So again, welcome, Stefan. OK, welcome you, Tom. And uh, hello to everybody, and um, yeah, Tom. Thanks to you that uh, you make the control experiments uh, happen, which uh, I'm going to talk uh, soon yeah. on them, right? Okay. Yeah. First, let's go into the history of uh, virology. And um, we have to go all back uh, 2,500 years. And uh, we have to listen to Pla Plato. Uh, when Plato is saying that the Greek medical doctors can't cope with most of diseases. He, he wrote this and he gives an explanation uh, for, for this catastrophe, which already happened at his time, right? And he said that when something is not working, something is ill, an organ, an eye, and bone, or something else, the, the, the doctors work on this, right? Where they see the symptom. But he says, they all forgot the source of the organ, the source of the eye, the source of the bone, it's the soul. So they're not treating the soul. This is his criticism and it's very, very uh, uh, sharp and very interesting. And it shows that something uh, was going on already by then. And for me, 
um, I went from the history, of course, from, from me being a student of biology, and then I went back. First, of course, um, I went into marine biology in order to help the oceans not to get more polluted, not to collapse, because they are producing 70% of oxygen. Of course, then I found in the marine algae a structure in an organ where usually spores are built. Spores, which you can see with the light microscope, they, they are going to sit down, they are going to grow and build a, a big, big algae again. Right. And in this algae, I observed that there were no spores produced, but an amorph mass. So I went with this in the electron microscope to see it's, it's, a, it's a fungi or fungal spore. So what's going on? And I saw billions of, of small particles, hexa, hexagonal, like we uh, uh, think uh, viruses uh, look like. And I thought, whoa, I found a harmless virus and a harmless stable virus host relationship because the production of the harmless virus was not doing harm to the algae and I had really to fight to get a lab and when I managed this um, I could isolate this structure and uh, I thought I have a harmless virus and then when an other professor a friend of mine I could use his his lab space he was a, a real big specialist on nucleic acid and sequencing and uh, it was the Austrian professor Fritz Pohl. And he told me, hey, Stefan, did you check what you are telling to the students? You are warning in front of uh, AIDS and HIV and everybody should use double condoms. And, and so did you check this? And I said, mm, the world is saying this. And he told me he was not asking the world, he was asking me. Anyway, I asked him why he, um, has questions on this and why he's questioning this. And he told me that he heard some rumors that Gallo was manipulating. So I went, he said, I should go immediately to the library and every paper of interest I should copy twice for him. And so we started to discuss on this thing. And this how I came into the history of rhyology. And very soon I realized that uh, Gallo, in order to prove that he has a virus, he was killing his cell cultures. And the other one who eventually got the Nobel Prize in 2008 for HIV, the French Montagnier, he said, no, no, my virus, if it's a virus at all, uh, then it's multiplying the white blood cells. So we have an illogical overload. But what he was saying at this time already, if the people will stop using uh, uh, sexual drugs and eat uh, uh, good food, vitamins and pure water, they even will get not only healthy, but get rid of the, of the virus. So everybody was hating Montagnier, but in the end, he received the Nobel Prize for 2000, in 2008. That's an important part of biology because two different concepts. But it was the reason I saw that Gallo was really manipulating. He was killing his cell cultures with hydrocortisol. And I thought, so some probably more than Gallo and probably all the scene and the politicians are aware of this act of betraying. And so um, I thought biology is, is betrayal. And this was a big uh, mistake because, of course, what I saw in both papers of Gallo and of Montagnier, I saw they claim a virus, but they never saw a virus like me. I could isolate a structure. I could see it in great number inside the host in, in an isolated form. I could do the biochemical analysis of all its proteins and the most important thing, its genetic material always a given size, always the same structure and always the same sequence. So, and in the paper of Montagnier and Gallo, nothing, nothing like this appeared. Only an, an enzymatic uh, activity was equaled that there should be a virus somewhere else around. And as the cells were dying, that uh, they think all the materials or at least some of the materials of the cell cultures dying in the lab are viral and 
So it's their secret how they could choose some of them and say, look, those are the, the viral proteins using in the antibody tests. At this time, everybody was antibody testing. ELISA, you know, or Western blood. In principle, it's the same. So, well, um, of course, when I realized that there is a virus in the title, but no viral structure inside, I thought I have overseen something or medical doctors are, you know, keeping their real isolation protocols secret and I don't know. So I was not speaking with anybody uh, on this because I was afraid losing my lab. I mean, in the fifth term as a young student, I had my own lab access to every kind of electron microscopic and, and microscopic techniques, you know. So, um, but then I was sure I was looking right and left. I saw, oh, measles virus the same. Hepatitis A and B, the same. A virus claim, but no virus. So, and this is how I, I, I went in. And then, of course, I blamed uh, the other one, uh, establishing the, the, the infectious theory, Robert Koch, I blamed him as, and, and Louis Pasteur, I blamed him uh, as guilty of this betrayal, what's going on, you know. And um, in fact, um, Pasteur wrote down in his, his diary, which became public at the Princeton University in 93, you know, that he was cheating, that he was really intentionally uh, 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 killing sheep and saying, look, in public events, look, they died because they were infected and not vaccinated. And he was using sheep, not infected, not treated with nothing, and said, look, they are vaccinated, they are infected, and nothing happens. And all sorts of these things we, I found in his, his diary. And, uh, but to my great, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I was really shocked when I was reading Max Perutz in my favorite newspaper. My favorite newspaper till this moment was the New York Review of Books. I mean, this is the intellectual flagship. I found such a lot of important articles uh, in this paper. And all of a sudden, Peretz was writing. And, uh, oh, thanks God that Montané was cheating a little bit. Otherwise, the infectious theories would have no uh, possibility to become uh, a, a, a global act of knowledge. At this time, there were no proofs. And thanks God. Uh, Montagne was exaggerating. So anyway, um, then I was going uh, more back in history. Where does the concept comes from? Because vi virus means a toxic protein, a toxic substance, a toxin of disease. That means virus in Latin. And so before 52, a virus was really thought to be a, a protein which is toxic. And only after 22, 1922, a virus was thought to be a nucleic acid, a dangerous one. The poor one naked like Ebola and <laughs> the rich one with an envelope. Anyway, so we have a paradigm shift in, shift in 52. And so I, I went back in history, where does this concept arose from? And I eventually landed at uh, Rudolf Virchow in 1858. And then I, of course, I understood very quick where this concept arose because before uh, there was the notion uh, uh, which originated in, in ancient Greek, that uh, the diseases are caused when a liquid inside your body, we had a four liquids, it's going to be stuck. And then this liquid turns out into a toxin, a, a toxic substance, which is causing disease. And uh, this was the ancient uh, uh, theory of disease, the, the liquid, the humoral theory of disease. And this was, uh, uh, abandoned already because uh, when there was uh, light microscopes, even lens in, in 1650, my peaky, they saw, well, organs are built out of different layers of tissue. But when we have a change in, a, in an organ and a disease, the disease is not spreading left or to the right, never. So all observations 
are disproving or were disproving the, the theory that the toxin it's built up somewhere in the body and it's spread by diffusion, right? So this was already abandoned um, and Wirchow also took a great deal to disprove this theory in 1884. But all of a sudden, 10 years older, for given reasons I won't outline, outline here at the moment, he came up with a completely different theory and he reactivated this old uh, uh, idea of a, a toxin, of disease, of a virus uh, in, inside his new theory. And of course, he had to become famous, he, had, he was full of debt, uh, uh, his father put on him, he wanted to become priest, his father forced him to, to study uh, medicine. In 1848, uh, he really claimed very important thing that all infectious diseases disappear immediately if the people became food, if they become water to wash, to clean, if they had no insects in their beds walking around, if they can heat in winter. I mean, uh, these were his claims in, in 1848. And for this, he is, he is praised till today. But 10 years later, when the revolution and the time, the political situation in Germany becomes really stiff, much more harder than in 48, then he came up with a, a new uh, theory. And he said, um, the cell, we are not originating out of tissues, which was already at this time was, was established fact. He said, we are coming out of single cells and the cell is the smallest indivisible unit of life. And that all diseases are coming out of a single cell when the cell is producing the toxin of disease, so the virus. So this is the same idea of disease, the liquid theory now uh, uh, produced or uh, uh, inside uh, seen inside a cell. Why Wirchow came up with this uh, theory of a cell? Because, and this was the next great finding, that all our theory of life, that we are originating out of atoms, that atoms touching themselves, building molecules, and then life, it's coming out of this. This is not invented by, by the atom theory by Einstein, or, or if not by Wirchow. This was invented in, in, in Greece by, by uh, uh, Democrit. And Epicure was transporting this, making it uh, very public later on. This comes from, from old Greece, this theory, and Wirchow just came across this theory and was using it. And because it was uh, already fashionable in the Enlightenment, but also uh, before, that all explanations of life should be without God, without ghost, without a field, without consciousness. This was one prerequisite in order to be a scientist because uh, this was the, the, the baseline of the enlightenment as a counter action or a counter uh, reaction on, on, on uh, more than thousand years of, of, of church, uh, you know, misbehavior in Europe. And so um, all explanation on life could only be materialistic. And in fact, even those in the Enlightenment have not uh, invented this theory. As I found when going back, even more and more back in history, I landed at Democrit. And he said, we are uh, producing a new theory of life because we won't know God anymore inside the explanation for given reason, for good reason. He said that uh, a lot of religions are in causing, causing fear in the people in front of God. They are afraid of God, that God is punishing and God is, is, is uh, punishing with disease. That was the Catholic, Catholic Church telling for, for more than a thousand years, you know. So they said, we want to uh, have a, a, a theory of life without any of this sort. And they could not imagine that this became an, an, a religion on its own, you know with the ancient theory 
that, yeah, when the liquid stock inside the body, then they turn into a toxic matter. And uh, amen, this is it, what, what we have now. And not only in virology, virology at the, at the moment is the tip of the iceberg, the visible, very visible tip of the iceberg. <laughs> but it's also the very sharp needle to, to implode the balloon, which we have and gets every day uh, <laughs> bigger, you know. So, and... But the challenge, what we have, it's not only virologists, it's, it's cancer, for example, it's all chronic disease. I mean, um, when somebody's believing that in his body, his own matter, its own substances turn into the bed, into a vicious thing, nobody's able to get it under control and it's going to eat you up. And even if that it's going to march, you know, inside your body then we are in the theory of metastasis. So, and, and this is the majority of people believing it. And if, of course, if you are believing cancer, if you believe in metastasis, you are believing in flying metastasis, which you can spill out. And therefore we have to, we are mask. And that's why the majority is believing into this concept. It's our history and we have to face our history and it's so deeply inside our thing that all our thinking it's it's so 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 deep in and um, as a, a student as a pupil i had to learn all of this and so if we castrate our imagination right we had no we have no other means to uh, imagine what is disease or even what is health, you know? And uh, this is the challenge uh, what we have to see that um, we have to work to come back to the roots and the roots have been in Ayurvedic medicine. I mean, there was the soul is dominating the old thing. And then depending uh, the, the liquid states inside your body, you know, which the Greek culture didn't understand, of course, it's, there are a, a huge body of proofs that the Greek culture was importing its medical knowledge from Ayurvedic philosophy, right? Which in India itself was destroyed by, by the British when they have been there and still are there. So the only um, uh, original philosophy and schools of Ayurvedic medicine you will find in Sri Lanka, by the way. So anyway, this is the history not only of virology, this is the history of disease. And it becomes clear when we have a mind setting that inside our bodies, there is no field acting, no God, no spirit, no consciousness whatsoever. We are forced to think in materialistic interactions only. And even with... Uh, with uh, Virchow, we are forced to think that when we are bulk of minerals and whatsoever fatty acid proteins, that to direct all of this, that every organism comes out of one single cell, which is not true, by the way, and the whole cellular concept, it's not true. Please read your Harold Tillman. It's all there in English. So, but then you are forced to imagine a building plan and a building, a functional plan for ourselves to produce a human being. This is what we are forced to. And then we are already in the dead end and we go into details and blah and that. And, and, and yeah, and of course we had then the, the, the shift in, uh, in the paradigm shift, the paradigm shift in, in 52, that uh, when they did the control experiments, they they realized, oh, our proteins we consider to be a virus, they also came into existence when we let healthy organs, healthy tissue into decay, then we have exactly the same. And in electron microscopy, we cannot see something specific. So, and um, then the new virology was orientating itself on those structures I had the luck to isolate some of the out, out of the ocean. Nowadays, they call themselves, the virologists call themselves giant viruses because they have such a huge genetic material, you know, always the same length, 
always the same structure, always the same sequence. So, and what I found, it's not a harmless uh, virus out of this thing. It's a kind of mini spore. It's not a spore itself. When the algae realized that there is no condition to build normal spores, which can swim, look to find a good place for itself and grow out again. So they built much smaller particles. And those particles were first uh, uh, detected isolated and characterized in bacteria. And in bacteria, they are called bacteriophages. Phage from phagocytosis to eat, to swallow. But those structures are not eating the bacteria. This is a misconception. This is already, you know, uh, uh, a very narrowed view to the things. Uh, when bacteria are dying, we must be a virus, right? So, but in the end, uh, these are mini spores which can themselves develop again into larger units. This was Enderline already uh, uh, claiming that uh, the, the, the cellular theory of life must be wrong because he observed that a cellular structure disintegrate into smaller structures. He just could observe in light microscope and even smaller one, they could not absorb anymore. And, but also uh, smaller structures do materialize out of invisible structures and forming cells. So this is what he was seeing. And, um, but this was the minority because uh, with Wirchow, Wirchow's attempt was uh, to unite medicine and uh, state 1848 for good reason to help people to avoid plagues and everything and in 58 uh, it was uh, he adapted to the new political uh, situation and he said well in in medicine it's like uh, in state as the single cells could easily you know uh, get parasitic get egoistic and then kill the head and so it's in the state as well one does not see it directly but uh, he gave some really good <laughs> indications that he meant the jewish people that they easily can get out of control, get parasitic, you know, endangering the head, the king. And he was friend, he became friend uh, to the king because uh, um, his uncle from his mother's side, Mr. Hese, he was the friend of the king. And so he became a, a boss of the Charité in 58. I mean, the leading clinic in, in, in Germany where now all the, 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 the Corona crisis originated out from. Only with Professor Trostens, the virologist from the Charité um, uh, doing, he uh, uh, managed that the local panic in Wuhan uh, would, would uh, uh, spread uh, into a, a global panic. It was the doing of uh, Professor Trosten, which I outlined in, in my papers on what he was doing. So this is the story. Uh, from the detail from a mini spore to bacteriophages, which then from in 54 became the, the model of viruses. How should a model uh, a virus look like? Uh, a stable nucleic acid of a given size, given structure, given sequence, enveloped inside an, 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 a shell out of protein. This is what we'll find in bacteriophages and giant viruses better named mini spores, right? Smaller than the usual spores. So, and they become the model of wh what, uh, how viruses should look like. So when then in uh, 54, uh, uh, John Franklin Enders came up with the idea, of, okay, we don't know what is a virus because the experiments 52 with bacteriophages uh, disproven the old idea of virus because the old idea was a protein is a toxic, a virus is a toxic protein, which the capability of self-replication, because it was thought the protein itself is the genetic material. So all proteins are able to self-replicate. But in doing research with bacteriophages in 52, it was become known that a protein always needs a nucleic acid to be replicated, right? 
For this, uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine was given in, in 69, and it's really interesting and important to check uh, the justification of the Nobel Prize in 69 uh, for the phage group, because the last sentence says, this phage just became the model for the whole virology model. And here we are. What they are, what they are believing uh, that when cells in the laboratory are dying, and this is what John Franklin was doing in 54. He was bacteriologist. He knew, ah, when we starve bacteria to death, and if we maltreat them, they all of a sudden transfer themselves into phages, which are there, of course. And he said, look, now we are without model of biology, but probably when cells are dying equally like bacteria in the test tube, Probably it's the same that they transfer themselves into viral matter. This was in, 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 in June 54, where nobody had an idea how a virus is going to look like, right? The old virus actually abandoned themselves. So, but because Enders got in December 54 the Nobel Prize for an old idea of him on poliovirus, the old virology from 48, this paper from June 54 became a scientific fact, which was never ever questioned. Even Enders was saying in his paper on the 1st of, 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 of June 54, that this is speculation, that it's, we see a lot of contradictions, probably the cells dying because of unknown factors or another virus inside there. So here we go, they never took out control experiments, which we are now carrying out at the moment. Again, I carried them out in a missile virus process, which I won at the end. And we are carrying them out now, especially for Ebola. And they were not realizing, and not uh, realizing till today, that they are killing those cells, intoxifying them with cytotoxic antibiotics, starving them to death, reducing the nutrition, and of course, adding uh, material proteins which are in decay and everything which is in decay, it's toxic and, and, and disturbing those cell causes in the, in the test tube. And, but when those cells are dying in the test tube, they equal it with the presence of the virus, with the isolation that they isolated from something outside the laboratory, inside the laboratory, and call it the isolate. And the material not uh, being uh, uh, filtered, it's called the living virus and it's used as a vaccine, <laughs> you know, uh, they, because they believe till today, it's turning everything into viral matter, which is in the case in bacteria, but never proven in, in, in cells and disproven. And then they begin to take small pieces out of proteins and adding them up mentally to a model of a virus. They add up very small pieces of nucleic acid and add them up to a, a long nucleic acid, which is a pure mental product and never isolated, never seen anywhere. So this is uh, the history of virology, how it evolved and how it became a, a self-fooling mechanism, of course, with fooling the whole society, but where there was a predisposition for, you know, disbelief because there were no other thinking since two and a half thousand years. So this is it, what, what, uh, what's, what's going on. And I mean, to, uh, in order to, to get clear, I recommend everybody go into the history. It helps to understand where this is coming from, why so much people are believing in this concept, why my, I, I myself was believing in this concept, everybody, you know. And then it, if you know the history, you know the way out. If you know the way in, you know the way out. So if you don't know the, the no in, then you are without orientation, easy. So the next thing is, uh, the biologists are doing seven steps to fool themselves that, oh, when they photograph something, it's, it, it, it's a virus, or when they add up the small molecules to a big one, they, we have the viral genome. There are seven points, seven points. And if you just read them in the papers, material and methods, 
of any virus which is said to cause disease, you'll find two sensational things. And I mean, it's easy like this. And it poor me that I only in this year I came across how easy it is and to, you know, but uh, okay, that's it. So in every two of those seven steps, you'll find that they are disproving themselves. They are really deemed virologists themselves are disproving themselves. And in every step, every technique they are using in these seven steps, those are seven techniques, right? They never, never took out control experiments to show if not the experiments themselves are producing the results. And a scientific paper without a control experiment, without the control that the technique I used is falsificate, uh, it's, 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 it's varying the result or it's producing the, the result, it's not scientific. And therefore the law which regulates all means of, of uh, uh, pandemic measures, the infectious, law, the, the law of infectious diseases, it disclaims and this asks everybody to act in a scientific manner and science and the rules of science are defined. And therefore, just naming those seven facts and the anti-scientific behavior of the manifest anti-scientific uh, uh, um, proof of their own doing. Uh, this is what I ask in Germany now uh, to, to do the people. I call this action the red card for, for Corona. And uh, people are writing letters already to the health authorities and saying, look, those are the facts. You are academic, you can check it in 30 minutes. And therefore no means uh, 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 could be uh, uh, supposed or posed upon me. I'm free, I must not take a mask, I must not take a test and so on. And this activity starts. And this in the end, I, I, I'm absolutely sure is going to let the balloon explode or implode how you like it right Stefan could you run could you walk us through those seven steps oh please yeah the first step I mentioned already since endos every virology virologist believes when his cell cultures are dying in the test tube right that uh, there must have been a virus but they never controlled it so we controlled it twice already and we get the cells dying without infectious infectious material. So in so, other words, whether you put an initial virus or not, you get the same result. Exactly. And this is called the cytopathic effect when some cells are causing to melt uh, together or, you know, to just disappear. And when the button of the test tube becomes visible, this they call the cytopathic effect. And they equal it with the presence and the isolation of the virus. And then they believe the, the material which they'll find afterwards, this is of viral nature. This is in case of bacteria when they are producing uh, phages, right? This is the case when I am producing giant viruses, my, mini spores, right? But this is not the case in the test tube with eukaryotic cells. So interestingly, Enders actually said that in his original paper that we, we know that we get the same result even if we don't start with anything from a child with measles. That's it. And he also said in this paper that probably this what they are doing in the, in the test tube most likely has nothing to uh, nothing in common with real measles. We have just to, to read it, you know. And of course, a little bit history helps here again. Uh, Enders never studied medicine or biology. He served in World War uh, one as a pilot, as a young pilot already, he was 18, I think, there. And uh, then he studied sociology, he was dandy. Of course, he was ambassador in all these elite uh, universities and, and things. And, and then uh, he ran into, uh, he studied after World War II, he studied again uh, sociology and, and yeah, German language and, and Celtic, you know. So he ran into a biologist working on phages. And as a soldier, he, oh, wow viruses in bacteria he just went in and he had not to study biology to just run into the lab and do his work and do his phd on this so he lacked every scientific thinking right yeah 
Yeah. And of course, some other details because um, his idea for which he became the Nobel Prize in 48, he, it was stolen by Salk and Salk made the, the, the vaccine and given, didn't give credit or any outcome of his gains to, to end us. He had the idea that uh, the polio virus, it's not tissue specific. So uh, uh, Jonas Saik was buying all em human embryos all over the world, taking the skin up and the muscles down and uh, fermented it with a piece of brain of a diseased, polio diseased human being. And then this was the polio vaccine, right? So, yeah. and this was the reason why Enders was completely fed up and all the scientific uh, community. You can read this really very happily on a uh, very, uh, you know, uh, on, on Wikipedia even. Yeah. You find on the, uh, you know, English Wikipedia page, you'll find this story on Enders. Okay, and, so and let's go to the next uh, uh, art yeah. of the seven. They never take uh, carried out control experiments. And but they considered the molecules of the dying cells as viral. Okay. Yeah. The next step, what they are doing, they use uh, particles inside the tissue. They fix the tissue and uh, cut it in thin slices, thin slices, and look through the electron microscope. And they find some typical structures of dying cells, VLE, you know, some tissue dots, they, they walk like uh, 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 amoebs. And when they cut through with the electron microscope, uh, they show only the circles and claim, oh, those are viruses. But they never ever were isolating those structures showing, look, this is the viral nucleic acid inside, the viral proteins. And no control experiments, they never did the same with tissue cultures exactly treated in the same manner. You must imagine, they, they never ever did it. So this is point two. Then point three is they come up with another sort of, of particles uh, claiming uh, where they said, oh, those are viral particles. And um, if you go into the technical uh, details, you easily see that they uh, centrifuge all the, the proteins in the test tube down to, uh, to uh, to the button, and then they take it up with a syringe and mix it. And so they vortex <laughs> this mixture out of proteins, fatty acid, and detergents. And what we have, we have soap bubbles. The German expression is mitzele. I think in English it's my seal, right? Yeah, so my seal. soap bubbles. And then they add color stain, let it dry, and, and use another technique of electron microscopy to look from above. Uh, on these particles. So the same, they never isolated those particles and say, look, here we have the biochemistry, we have the viral proteins, we have the viral nucleic acid. They don't have it, okay? So, oh. and they did not the control experiment. They, if, they never tried it with uninfected, but same treated cell cultures in the same way, never. So it's yeah. completely, this behavior, it's, anti-scientific in point one, point two, point three, and all other uh, points to come. The fourth point, the fourth step, what they are doing from billions of small genetic debris, they are sequencing, they read the sequence of very small pieces, and then they add them up to a, a large piece. They add them up and this process is called alignment. And uh, it's, it's, it's incredible that they never ever carried out a, a control experiment with equally treated cell cultures, equally treated cell culture, and just doing the same. No control experiments. And the fact which itself they are disproving themselves, they add something to a big piece and the big piece never ever showed up in reality and since 50 years it's easy to show up the, that there is a, a a big genetic material of this given size is there this is called gel electrophoresis this is a standard technique to show yeah i have a piece of genetic material this given size with this technique all bacterial phages are genetically or from their nucleus acids, they were characterized, right? And yep. 
So this is uh, point four, point five. In order to build a genome uh, of the virus, when they came up, oh, I, I find a new virus in Wuhan, or I repeat the experiment, they always need a given genome as an, a point of orientation where they add the smaller pieces, where they do fit to, to a given genome. So this would be like a sentence out of the Bible from uh, with 30,000 letters, right? And we, 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 we use a, a small letters combination of one, two, three, five letters and try to fix them to the place where they, where they fit, right? And no control experiments again. And the control experiments would be to try to get the alignment of another RNA virus, which would be a measles virus, which would be... A, a, uh, Ebola virus, HIV, right? This yeah. would be the control experiment with the same data set. Let's try if we can fabricate another virus. And I can tell you, yes, it's it's like this. I showed it already in the measles virus process. And here in, 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 in um, Corona, it's going to sh show uh, hopefully soon, right? So in other words, you can take the same raw data set, the same pieces of short pieces of, D, of RNA in the mixture. And then you, you can create a, t you can find the template for the coronavirus or yes, the yes. template for the HIV virus or yes. the template for the measles That's virus. It. And then yes. you tell the computer to orient it or align it to that, uh, that yes. template. And in each case it will, which will make That's you it. say, yes, I found this person has measles they have HIV, they yeah. have Ebola, they have yeah. Zika, and by the way, they uh, have coronavirus. That's it. Yes. That's it. So, and this is then the definite uh, experimental disproof, you know, and um, can you imagine the coronavirus is said that it mutated uh, two years ago, it, come, it becomes into existence, right? So I'm now on my way to find an old data set 10 years ago on measles virus, right? Or on HIV, right? And I, as soon as I get hold of original sequence data, which was produced for HIV, I'm going to produce you coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2, definitely. And this is going to be the definitely uh, experimental disproval of, of virology. But yeah. till, till we have this, the arguments on its own, it's enough because we are at in, inside point five, yes? Yeah. And inside point five, where they use a given sequence to add the smaller sequences accordingly, right? This sequence, this given sequence, never ever came out of a virus. It's a biological uh, uh, unit. Itself, always, it's a fabricated thing, right? right. So, virology has no viral genome. <laughs> and everything what they, what they use in order to do an alignment, it's a fabrication on its own already. Yeah, that's why they call it an in silico uh, genome of an in silico virus. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah, but in silico, I, I mean, even this is a little bit, this, you know, because in silico there is some matter, but of course in silico, yes. Um, in English, it sounds better than in German. Okay, no, it's it's a good good. <laughs> it means it's okay. inside the computer only. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not okay. in reality. So let's come to point uh, six, you know, everybody thinks, and it was your question uh, at yeah. the beginning, if uh, that, that virology never ever saw a virus inside a living being or inside its liquids. And it's easy. Everybody can check it easily on every single photograph of a virus, which, could, which should show a virus, you'll find the notion that it's from a cell culture but never from the blood, never from the salvia, never from the semen, never from another liquid of the body, never from a lymph node, never from, from, from inside, not from a human, not from an animal, not from a plant. And this is astonishing. I mean, <laughs> they, 
they go to the moon, they go to the Mars, whatsoever, but they never managed to get a virus photographed inside a human being, nor that they can show its nucleic acid inside a liquid, body liquid, salvia or blood. We have all to wear mask in order not to spread the virus with every breath take, you know, uh, thousands of them, but they never ever. And this is completely unscientific not to tell the public that they never ever were able first not to show a virus inside their blood, inside a human being. And second, never ever were able to see the gene, the complete genome of a virus inside blood, inside uh, salvia, you know, never ever. And yeah. this is point six. You know, uh, Stefan, let me just comment on that. I, I spent some part of this morning looking in PubMed for any paper that described the morphology of a virus from a living t human being or living tissue, living yeah. diseased person. Yeah. And there, there are a few papers that, that claim that, but when you actually read the details, they say, well, they have very different morphologies. In other words, some of these particles look like bullets and some of them look round and some of them look like rods and somehow they're all the same virus. Yeah. And it's, it's bizarre. It's like, yeah. They, they, what they are doing, they say, look, we stain some of the proteins. Yeah. We have some, some specific antibodies. They are connected with a staining. Uh, and then uh, we'll see something inside the body. This is what they are doing, of course. But yeah. it's not showing the, that there is a particle somewhere. And right. for, <laughs> the definition of a virus, it's always its core. And that's the genetic material. And here we go. This has a given size, a given structure, and a given sequence. And yeah. this never ever shows up somewhere. And, and you must imagine all these masks, you know, and Biden are, are calling for two masks, you know. <laughs> I mean, how crazy. And so, but on the other hand, and thanks God, how could you think of a of a, a change of a paradigm shift in society without such a crisis? Impossible. Right. When I think a year back, I could not imagine that we had a success going to the streets. Now, now the people are listening on the streets. And now in Germany, the politicians are saying, look, 30% uh, uh, of the German population, it's not believing in virus anymore. And wow. uh, so we need another 20% and then the next election, then it's done, you know. And uh, this is our work, what we have uh, to do to convince the facts, naming the facts where everybody can, uh, uh, on its own, can check it and can check the logic. And the seventh point, it's very interesting because in, in a review work of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, they published a review of 89 pages to the earlier history of um, of biology. Uh, Tom, can I have a short break? There is the bell down running. Yeah, well, I was going to try to finish, uh, but yes, if you need to, to okay. go. Okay, I'll uh, come back soon. So you take over, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, not sure how. Uh, so I think what we'll do here is we'll hear uh, the seventh, and then I'm going to ask Stefan how people can learn more about uh, what he's doing and how to even participate and maybe help his studies. Uh, I think then what I'll do uh, is when we have the Friday session, um, there may be some things that Stefan said that I can try to further explain. Um, so I will try to do that on Friday during the usual, I think it's two o'clock Eastern time session. Um, yeah, uh, this, you know, it's interesting, this, this last point, uh, point six, is something that's just so key to this whole thing, because if you ask 
well, if you tell any, anybody out there, have they ever actually seen isolated, characterized, and found the entire genome of a single so-called pathogenic virus from a person who's sick with that disease? I, you know, I have spent hours and hours looking through PubMed, searching, you know, all the, all the sites that any doctor or anybody can get access to. And there's literally no, no article that demonstrates that. As hard as that is to, for all of us to believe, as hard as that is to wrap your brain around, that's just the fact. Um, you know, some of the ones I found today, because I was determined to see if there was even one article. They, they make references to something, but it's not anything like Stefan is describing. All right, Stefan, we'll do seventh, and then I want you to uh, uh, tell people how they can help you do uh, with this, where they can go to get more information, maybe contribute, donate, uh, or just find out more about what they can do to, to help. Well, um, there are some, some important English text on my web page, freely available for further information. Um, I think the most important thing is um, uh, to study uh, the deeper biology. There are already three translations of, or a translation of three texts on mine. And the basis is um, uh, the findings of Dr. Hammer, which he once called the, the, the new medicine, right? This is uh, uh, the, the actual and the really scientific form of uh, um, psychosomatic, but psychosomatic would be too short as explanation, you know? Uh, he came for his own experience with, after his son died, he developed uh, the cancer of testicle and then he thought, well, does it happen to others? He asked other patients and he said, yeah, how do you know that my child died? And he said, it happened to me. So he went into um, brain scans himself and others with the same diagnosis. And he found that always in the same part of the brain, the same disease gives a signal, right? And so he could, uh, he thought that he solved all the, the, the open questions on, on cancer. But later he found it um, that it's with skin, with hair, with teeth, with everything, you know. Um, and these findings are of greatest importance to study because you learn two things. Second, that the old model, that something from outside comes inside and destroys you, can't possibly be true. And the most important is you learn uh, the, uh, how spirit works, how spiritual, spirituality works on you, how, how we, we are functioning. You see that every part of your body has their own consciousness of his uh, function at this side, being the skin on the outside or a part of the organ inside. And does it, uh, uh, it, it can change when it becomes under pressure. This could be a really accident, but also a situation where you are believe that you are live under a, a constant alarm, that it becomes exceptional, that, that the thing what happened, it's, it's too much for you. You are isolated from, from everybody. And then uh, your flesh is it's, it's, it's changing and, uh, you know, uh, you know, everybody knows a word can kill and a word can heal. And this you are going to learn when you are uh, checking uh, this information on, on, on the new medicine. I think, Tom, you had an interview already with a lady in the States working on this. At least Andy yeah, had an we're, nice we're gonna, We haven't done it yet, but we're going to get to that. But let, let's just, I, I just want to wrap this up just so it's, we're careful of your time here, Stefan. So, um, Maybe just go through the seventh point, just quickly. Okay, ah, the seventh point, it's easy. Um, in this review where I, was, I, I spoke about of the Max Planck Institute um, on history of science, there you can read that uh, when the old biology was disproving itself themselves, they find out when they took out uh, uh, animal experiments, 
they never ever were able to transmit a disease, an infectious disease. But this is said nowadays, you know, that we have a model for COVID-19, we have a model for measles, we have this and that. So, and if you check these publications, you will see that they are A, completely anti-scientific because no controls, and B, that the treatment of the animals injecting large amounts of liquid into the brain, inside the ear, inside the eye, with a tube inside your lungs, that the, the conditions of the experiments themselves are causing the disease. Yeah, right? Right. It's easy like this. Okay. So that was the seven points. Okay. Tell, Stefan, tell us your website uh, so that people can find out more. So the website is uh, Wissenschaft uh, Plus with double F. Probably you spell it. Yeah, in a, we'll, we'll, way we'll, we'll, we'll put it on, uh, on the show notes okay. or something like and, that. And uh, probably um, I think soon there is going to a translation of the red card for Corona, okay. right? Uh, this uh, is a web page where I have the seven points inside. I hope soon there is going to be a, um, a book, a book a published, or our book in German, Corona, uh, further into chaos or a chance for everybody that yeah. this is going to be in English as well. And anyway, I mean, you have such a lot of information attracted in, in, your, uh, in your work. I mean, um, the importance of, of nutrition and, and all those things. Uh, yeah. um, there's such a lot of information out there and uh, you contributed uh, a lot. I think the bottom line here, Stefan, if you agree, is that it's the, the chemistry and the, and the structure follows consciousness, not the other way around. That's it. And that's, that's the most the important thing. When you see, when you see the, the work of Hammer, he, he had he had printed out a big tabella where you will find according to all kind of tissues to the four tissues we have, yeah. and uh, you'll find every piece of organ or skin, you know what may happen here or there, and if you see it and you turn it into the positive that not a trauma is acting, which he terms a biological conflict but you turn it into its function, then you see the building map of God, of your body. I yeah. mean, how, it, how it, it's meant. And it, it's, it's immediately, it's a proof that uh, when everything has its consciousness at its place and inside your, then of course it had its consciousness inside the whole context. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't uh, start an end where we are visibly be seen because we have to breathe and we have, this is the energy which comes into us, you know, and it's not only coming from the sun, we are connected with, with, with everything. And I, I mean, this is probably um, the most important uh, information. For me, it was the, the most important thing that I could get rid of this atom theory living yeah. in the nowhere, in the vacuum, you know, and so, uh, this is just not true. We are living in the ether and the substance water is building when building a surface, this sign, sin lining. This is the own substance on its own and that's the substance our tissue are out of. Got and it. this substance creates everything and even all the molecules and elements and they go back into this substance. And this is the reason that the stronger we are in the mind, the stronger we can deal with toxins and with everything. I mean, yeah. look into the, the prisons where people are not well nourished and the ones who are, have a clear mind, a clear belief, and they go out strong, upright and healthy, no teeth, loves, you know. So those are the proofs that the consciousness, you know, goes before. And of course, when the matter is there, our body, we have to fulfill its own rules, you know, the blood streaming, the oxygen, the flow of energy and information and being connected with, with it. And, and the one who is happy, who, who has his belief uh, that he is wanted and that he's part of a thing, you know, because I think the most cruel thing in life is that you really believe or you are afraid that you are a product of, of uh, by accident and then if you disintegrate nothing will rest and this this thing which Friedrich Nietzsche was 
writing down step by step what this makes out of a human being and out of him, driving him directly into madness. This is the main source, I think, the main reason why humankind is so mad, why they are so greedy, why they want to prove themselves, you know, yeah. in their short lifetime to become rich, to be powerful, to compensate this, you know, um, uh, as uh, this, 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 this uh, incredible uh, uh, notion. Yeah. It's, it's a misconception. It's a, it's a huge misconception. It's a huge misconception, and uh, in our culture, it's originated some uh, 200, uh, uh, 2,500 years ago, and we have a chance now to, to reverse it. Change I mean, the whole thing. Yeah. Stefan, okay, we're going to do this again someday, and we're going to... As and often as, as needed, as often as wanted. I thank you very much for your dedication, for your students, for your friends. For your Great. colleagues. Stefan, thank you. Everybody read, go to Stefan's website, read the papers. They're amazing. And Stefan, thank you very much. And yeah, we'll be in touch. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye.